What is happening? What is all of this? Did you see that article? Every year, these liberal elites kidnap a bunch of normal folks like us and hunt us for sport. You actually believed we were hunting human beings for sport. <laughs> but you are. What kind of sick people would even think of something like that? White people. We're the worst. John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off Kami. Really quick, I have to thank my boy Dylan, my boy Jeremy, my boy Jared. Without their support, I could not go see these terrible movies and share with you the tales of my experience. And I also have to shout out my guy Preston, just got back from Sin City. Apparently did a bit of gambling. Can't say that I endorse, but I've been told to state for the record that the next time they go, Preston and Nick are going to crush a car with a tank, which I believe is a reference to Battlefield Las Vegas, but I'll have to disavow just in case since I'm about to talk about why the left endorsing political violence is bad and dumb. But really quick, the win window on the Epic Spring Tour is closing, so if you want me to come to your school, fill out the form, be sure to leave your email, it's on the website, it'll be in the description, we're planning it ahead of time, if it gets shut down by the virus, so be it, but I think we'll be okay, we will will it into existence if we have to, if all else fails, but yes, that is correct, ladies and gentlemen, I did it once again, I went to go see another terrible Hollywood movie, so that you guys don't have to, but you can still find out about what they're trying to normalize and promote within our culture, and a lot of people might think, oh, well, you know, it's just a movie, it's no big deal, and I'd agree with that to a certain extent, I don't think that this movie in itself is particularly consequential, but you have to think about why this movie was made, because when looking at any form of media or arts or entertainment, you can detect patterns that are indicative of greater cultural trends. So that this movie was made means not only that there are people working in Hollywood who felt compelled to tell a story about the literal slaughtering of people for political differences, which should be no surprise to us at this point, frankly, but also that they felt that there was a market for this type of movie and that executives uh, approved it and you know they must have agreed. So you can look at this movie, which is called The Hunt, by the way, um, and its plot is, quote, 12 strangers wake up in a clearing. They don't know where they are or how they got there. In the shadow of a dark internet conspiracy theory, ruthless elitists gather at a remote location to hunt humans for sport. But their master plan is about to be derailed when one of the hunted, Crystal, turns the tables on her pursuers. And I'm pretty sure that this is the rebranded plot of this movie because they were going to release it earlier, but then the mass shooting in Texas happened where the guy said that he was deliberately targeting Hispanics and they probably figured that it wasn't a good time to release a movie that glorifies violence against a specific group of people right after someone had committed an act of violence which was meant to target a specific group of people. And we'll get into the specifics of everything and put it all into context once we start going through the synopsis of the movie. I promise, but I have a few points that I want to go through beforehand. So firstly, I just want to share with you a little resource that's often passed around different humanities classes that deal with themes of oppression, uh, but not like actual oppression by like authoritarian governments. No, more so gender theory and queer theory and all that fun stuff, all that very educational stuff. And that's going to play a role in just a second. But this is called the Pyramid of Hate, and the Pyramid of Hate is basically meant to visualize the levels of hatred that can be held towards different groups of people and the degrees to which that hatred can and will manifest. Now, I'd of course never make the claim that conservatives are oppressed to this country, not like the transgenders are oppressed or the illegal aliens are oppressed. No, I would never, but I am going to just read through these really quick because I would like you to think about all of these descriptions and see if you can draw any conclusions from them because I simply cannot think of any. So the first level of the pyramid, which is located at the bottom, is just bias. And this is described as preconceived negative views of a group of people, which manifests in scapegoating a group as the cause of society's problems, um, accepting preconceived views and not challenging hateful statements or jokes at the expense of that group. Okay. Very interesting. Moving on to the next level, we have uh, individual acts of prejudice, and this is described as when someone tells hateful jokes or makes hateful statements. They may also avoid a particular group of people, ridicule them, call them very hateful names, okay? Very interesting, very interesting. Much to consider. On to the next level, we have discrimination. This includes preventing people of a particular group access to the same opportunities, but it may also escalate to harassing behavior. And this is actually the first pyramid step that goes beyond our freedom of speech and enters into legally prohibited behavior. Is this ringing any bells for you guys? I can't tell if it's ringing bells for me if I just have tinnitus or what, but we'll, we'll move on. The next level is violence, which often reveals the frightening nature of hate as it escalates into violence against people and their property. Individuals may be violently attacked or threatened, even escalating to murder and acts of terrorism. 
very interesting to me. I'm very interested in all of this. Now, one might object to the conclusions to which I'm alluding by citing examples throughout history during which this graphic would be largely applicable to entire groups of people, whether it's blacks in 19th century America, Jews in Nazi Germany, and that's a completely valid objection. I'm not claiming that the situation of conservatives in America is in any way comparable to those situations. As I've said many times before, I don't believe that anyone in the United States of America is oppressed, but from there, I would pose to you this question. What other group what other group of people could you make this movie about, if not conservatives? Name me one other group of people in America that you could plug into this storyline that would not result in lost jobs, media backlash, and cities burning. Like, I'll save you the time. There isn't one. This movie could only be made about people like us. So while it's true that we aren't oppressed by any means in this country, just like no one is oppressed by any means in this country, we are by far the most hated in this country. And the reason that we know that is there is no other group of people in this country whose hatred is more tolerated than ours. Think of all the groups in this country that are targeted. When we hear about the stories, we all think, wow, that's awful. But even though it happens far less to conservatives, when it does happen, it's swept under the rug, dismissed as nothing, or even celebrated. There's no other group of people in this country that can say the same, let alone that they'd have a mainstream Hollywood movie made about them like this. I mean, Universal Pictures put their name on this movie. And that's something else that I wanted to talk about. There's this misguided idea that pollutes modern conservatism like black ink. And that idea is that, well, businesses will always pursue what's most profitable. People will always pursue what's most profitable. And that's just not true. I mean, it's sort of true, but we have to be more specific. Businesses are made up of people and people will pursue what is most valuable to them, not necessarily what is most profitable to them. You see the difference? Because this movie's a great example. This movie costs them about $18 million to make, and it's done about $2 million gross at the box office so far. So for $18 million, they could have made a much better film and a much more lucrative film, but they didn't. Why? Because they wanted this story to be told for whatever reason, because they valued it. You see the same thing all the time with these different companies. Like, uh, I mean, what are we supposed to do when Goldman Sachs, which is one of the biggest investment banks in the world, what are we supposed to do when Goldman Sachs says, okay, we're going to start refusing IPOs if a company's board is made up of all straight white men? Do we start our own Goldman Sachs? Do we boycott Goldman Sachs? Are either of those going to be effective? Should they be effective? Should anything be done? Like, I'm a capitalist, just like you are. I mean, it's right here on my laptop. But what are we supposed to do when capitalism becomes woke? I haven't seen any real answers about this uh, from people on the right. And what really woke me up to this was actually my own experience working in politics. Like I'm looking at the opportunity cost of what I'm doing and I'm arriving at the conclusion that, okay, well, I don't really care if I'm starving because I'm forwarding the cause in which I believe to the best of my ability. And then I realized that's exactly what they're doing, just on a much bigger scale. Do you think that these multi-billion dollar corporations really care if they suffer a relatively small opportunity cost, if it means that the people working within those companies who subscribe to this ideology can forward the worldview in which they passionately believe? They don't because they believe that they're making the world better by doing it, even if it's at our expense or the expense of our country or the expense of our economy, whatever. And the question is settled. It's not a matter of if they're doing this. Turn on the TV, like pay attention to the ads that they're shoving in your face. Look at how woke and, and progressive these corporations have become. Look at how ineffective your boycotts are. Look, look how they're assisting in the normalization of a radical leftist politics. This is the reality of our situation. So the question is, given that, what do we do? And I'm really not quite sure yet. I've been thinking about this for a few months now. I'm not making a case against corporations. I'm not making a case for government's involvement. I'm just trying to get the gears turning a bit, you know? Like uh, this audience is pretty smart, pretty high IQ. I'll be interested to see what you guys think. Maybe we'll do a whole video on it. But for now, I would say the best thing we can do is assume that they care just as much as we do, if not more. But the problem is that you know, what we care about and what they care about don't really seem to be able to coexist. For example, we care about America and the American people. And they care about torching the foundations and history of America to the ground because they believe them to be evil. And they've demonstrated that they're more than willing to shut down any opposition to that. Do you see the problem? I mean, it goes back to the pyramid of hate because we are hated by the left. We are hated. Think of the ways that someone would act towards someone that they hate. Acknowledge that that's exactly how the far left treats conservatives connect the dots. Like we want everyone to come together, put differences aside. We're at the barbecue, Bruce Springsteen's playing in the background. They don't want that. They don't believe that we're acting in good faith. And I plan to do a video um, that talks about why that is, about why they don't like to be friends with conservatives. But it's a disappointing symptom of the current polarization of this country, which was driven by the far left. And unfortunately, we're dealing with the consequences of it. And the hypocrisy, which is a byproduct, by the way, of the irrationality, which led us here in the first place. For example, the left blames Donald Trump's nonviolent words for acts of violence. They blame nonviolent conservative voices for acts of violence. And they say that all of this should be shut down or even criminalized, even if it doesn't explicitly cause violence, simply because it could. 
And on the other hand, they spend about $18 million making a movie which literally glorifies the slaughtering of conservatives while implying that they deserved it for spreading fake news, which in real life is defined by the left as anything with which they disagree. I'm not making this up. Like, this is where we're at now. And I've read the film critics, like what they've had to say about this movie. I've read what the creators have said about it. And we'll talk more about how they're trying to kind of mask the true purpose of this film. But firstly, the creators of this movie were basically forced to come out and say, no, 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 this movie, it's all satire. It's all a joke, which is the default line for when you do something awful for which you have no excuse. But still, that leaves the question, does the satire excuse work? I would argue that it doesn't simply because standards have to be applied equally and consistently. And that's not something that the left has ever been willing to do with this particular concept. Like you can make a joke about black people and they call that hate speech, which then has the potential to incite violence against black people. Therefore, you should face legal action. But you make a movie where the plot is literally a group of liberal elites hunt and murder innocent conservatives. Well, no, but that's just satire. Can't you take a joke? It's impartial because the conservatives fought them too. Yeah, but they fought back because they were being captured and hunted in the middle of nowhere by a group of liberal elites. Remember, that's the whole point. And the movie tries to equate these things and even justify the whole situation. And it's just totally ridiculous. We'll go through it now because I did take notes, of course. Of course, anything for you guys. So the movie starts with this elite woman texting in a group chat with a bunch of her elite friends. And one of them says, oh, by the way, did you see what the rat in chief just did and they're all like yeah boo must resist and then one of them's like hey let's just slaughter a dozen deplorables and they're like yeah and then one of them's like hey isn't that wrong or something and then the other they're like no the no sentimentality comrade war is war and i was just in the theater just absolutely blown away by how little they tried to conceal the agenda of this movie because remember they were very open about it uh during the initial promotion and then they had to change the advertisements after the shooting and i didn't actually think that they were just gonna come out like swinging like that. I mean, we're five minutes in. We've got anti-presidential language, which I guess could be interpretive. But then to refer to the enemies as deplorables, which remember was the, the infamous line uttered by Hillary Clinton in reference to Trump supporters, and then to also refer to each other as comrades, which is often used in socialist circles in reference to the Russian Revolution. It was just amazing to me. But anyway, so the movie continues, and there's a scene of a bunch of these elite people on a private plane, and then all of a sudden this guy just comes into the main cabin, and he seems very incoherent. Turns out he's one of the deplorables that they kidnapped to bring into the middle of nowhere to hunt for fun. So one of the guys stabs him in the neck to death with a pen, and he refers to the guy as a redneck after he kills him. And by the way, every redneck in this movie just dresses like a middle-class father, like from middle America. It's just really funny because you can see how out of touch the people who made this movie actually are because all of the characters who are supposed to be these backwoods hillbillies, they're just wearing normal clothing. And I can just imagine the meetings that took place for this movie. They're like, hey, what kind of clothing do the rednecks wear? And they're just like, hmm, probably blue jeans. And they're like, hmm, how uneducated. Like, I don't think they've actually ever seen working class Americans before. But anyways, then all the deplorables wake up in this big grassy field, kind of like in the first Hunger Games movie. And then there's this blonde girl who kind of looks like Ivanka Trump. And we're following her for a while as she tries to, you know, kind of figure out where she's going, what's going on. And this girl's like really nice looking. She's got blonde hair. I was watching and I was just sort of thinking to myself like, oh, she probably represents the archetypal conservative girl. And then her head literally exploded. And I was like, yeah, probably. Like she was standing next to this wooden crate. And then someone in the distance, I guess, just hunted her uh, by just making her head cease to exist. So that was something. And then and the guy who she was with, who is one of the only two masculine men in this entire film, by the way, all of the rest of them are totally beta, very pathetic, weak men. So this guy runs to go save this other woman who was running away and she fell down or something. So he runs over, turns out she fell down into, like, into this pit it was maybe like four feet deep uh, and she got impaled because there were like spikes. It was a spike pit, but she's still alive. So the guy gets her out and then he's helping to get her over to cover in the trees. And then they look down, they realize they just stepped on a landmine. And then the guy just realizes this and he's kind of like, oh man. So he blows up, he's dead. But the woman actually gets thrown back into spike pit, gets impaled yet again. So then this other guy comes over to try and save her, but he's like shocked by the image of her body being impaled. And she yells at him, I kid you not. What are you, a snowflake? And I was just like, bruh, like snowflake. Is it 2015? Like that meme is five years old. There was no line of dialogue in this movie that's said by a deplorable that anyone on the right actually says. It's just a very silly caricature that tries to be authentic. But then I'm pretty sure they both die. Uh, then some people try to hop over a fence, but then this one guy gets hit with an arrow and then blown up by a grenade as you do. And then there's some people running down a dirt road towards this convenience store. And so they get inside and there's an older couple who's running it and they're freaked out. They're trying to figure out where they are. 
And they also have some guns now, by the way. And here's one of the very telling exchanges of dialogue in this whole movie, which is indicative of its broader agenda. So the shopkeeper asks the man to lower his weapon. The man says, no. The shopkeeper asks, or no, he says, well, you know, I'm just worried about it going off. And so the man says, well, it's not going to go off. I have experience with firearms. I own seven of them. So the shopkeeper asks him why he owns seven guns. And the man says, it's my right. And the shopkeeper replies by saying, so. The people shooting at you are just exercising their rights too. And you can see what they're trying to do here. Like they're trying to make this guy look like a hypocrite. They're trying to make all of the people in the audience who are dumb enough to see this movie in the first place, not even to complain about it on their commentary channel. Go like, wow, that's a good point. Gun owners are in the wrong, which ignores a few things. Firstly, there's a difference between owning a gun and shooting someone with a gun. And there's also a difference between using a gun to attack someone and using a gun in self-defense. These people were all using them in self-defense against the liberal elites who were literally hunting them. And the movie wants to blur all of these lines so that the the umbrella of guns just looks bad. And I also like how they made this guy have seven guns so that everyone in the audience is like, seven guns? That's so many guns. But if gun owners actually watched this movie and he said he only owned seven guns, he would be laughed at. Those are rookie numbers, relatively speaking, right? So the people that made this movie are thinking like, oh, well, what's a scary number of guns to own? Seven. So the leftists, they watch this movie and they're like, seven guns. And then the the, the gun owners, they watch it, they're like, seven guns, that's it. But, you know, anyway, so it turns out the shopkeepers were in on it the whole time. So they pull out a sawed off and they shoot the guy, kill everyone else. Then this blonde girl comes in a little bit later. She realizes that they're the bad guys. She kills them. This is actually the first instance of when the deplorables start to fight back. And it's really only this woman that does any of that. So then she leaves. The shop meets up with this other deplorable. They head for these railroad tracks. Uh, The other guy explains to her his theory on what's going on. And we get to hear another sentence that has never been said before by someone on the right before. Because the sentence goes, every year the liberal elites, you know, the globalist cucks that run the deep state, they round us up and kill us. And it's just like, please stop. Like whoever wrote this dialogue just went on 4chan for seven minutes and they just jotted down every word that they saw. And they put it all together like some sort of alt-right mad lib and it's just so cringe but so then they go onto the train they get on uh, there are these refugees hiding there in the cargo the guy starts screaming and calling them crisis actors because remember that one time that that crazy internet guy accused people of being crisis actors and then also supported trump that means that our average trump supporter one of our deplorables is going to be just like that it's totally representative oh and then he also refers to uh this theory of liberal elites rounding up conservatives and killing them as Mannergate because, you know, it supposedly happens at this manor in Vermont. But we all know that that's supposed to be a play on Pizzagate. So the guy ends up flipping out on one of the liberal elites who was pretending to be a refugee. He shoves a cooked grenade down his pants and then runs away. The guy explodes. Gary, that's his name, he takes off. Uh, and so then the woman from earlier is left there in this refugee camp and we're supposed to watch her there and be like, wow, I guess she's learning what it's like to, to be a refugee. This is a consequence of not supporting open borders. But then she meets up with another deplorable who made it to the the camp and he's excited because he tells her we're gonna be on Hannity which again is something that has never been said by anyone on the right uh but then you know this guy tells them that he'll drive them to safety or whatever so they're in his car and then he starts asking them questions about what's been happening to them and this is another very telling moment in this movie because he asks them things like oh well can you think of any reason that this might be happening to you I mean I wouldn't want to blame the victim but there must be something that you guys did which is him trying to justify what's happening to them so then the woman picks up on the fact that he's working against them she kills him they pull the car over open up the trunk they find the guy from earlier Gary he's dead in the trunk so then they figure out where all these liberal elites are hiding out uh, and they go to try and find them one of the elites leaves the bunker to go pee and i forgot to mention this earlier in the beginning when they were by that wooden crate the crate opens up and this little pig ran out and everyone's just kind of confused so anyways they've got this pig now right and so this is the highlight of the whole movie the liberal guy is peeing and then the boomer redneck turns a flashlight on to illuminate himself holding this pig and he just goes hey is this your pig and then the girl comes from behind and just opens up the guy's throat with a knife i don't know why i found that so funny just hey is this your pig (laughs) and so they go and um they release the pig into the bunker. Everyone flips out because they think that it's an intruder. So they start shooting. The pig gets hit and dies. This woman screams, Orwell, no, he was innocent. Orwell, of course, being a reference to Animal Farm written by George Orwell, which is a critique of Stalinist Russia. And this plays a role at the end of the movie. But uh, so then the girl runs in, kills everyone. And then right as she's about to kill the, the last woman, she asks, you know, why are you doing this to us? And then the woman responds by mocking what she presumes is the woman's faith by snapping back. Well, because Jesus told me to. So then she dies. Uh, then we're led to believe that Boomer Redneck is actually working 
working with them too. So he dies. Then there was this ex-National Guard guy that was working with them who was the second of only two masculine men in this entire movie. She kills him too, but he told her where the lady in charge is hiding out. So then she goes to confront the lady. Uh, but then we get flashbacks to one year ago, which provide a lot of context to the story. Basically, it turns out that those texts that we saw at the beginning got leaked to the public and a bunch of people started spreading a theory around that they were actually doing this to deplorables. And then all of the elites lost their jobs because of it. Man, you know, don't you hate it when cancel culture comes back to bite you? But yeah, I really like the way that she refers to the deplorables here in the scene because she calls them gun clutching homophobes and academically deprived racists. And I think that this is very telling because these liberal elite types tend to value their precious education because it makes them feel superior to other people. And this type of thing absolutely disgusts me. You can talk to anybody that knows me personally. They will tell you with complete certainty that nothing makes me more angry than people using their education to assert superiority to other people. And there's a lot of reasons for this, but for now, we'll just stick to the ones that are most applicable to this story. So firstly, the type of education that they're talking about, the university education is basically a joke. Studies have shown that people are less educated after leaving college, plus they get tens of thousands of dollars of debt. Uh, you know, they get to become educated and all this nonsense that we mentioned in the beginning, stuff like gender theory, queer theory, this type of garbage that has polluted the humanities disciplines. And that's part of it. Even ignoring that, the practical education of the average redneck versus the average liberal elite is literally not even comparable. I've spent lots of time with both of these groups of people because of where I grew up, where I visited, and I can promise you that the people that they call rednecks, while they might not be able to explain exactly how there came to be between 56 and infinity genders, any problem that you have relating to anything with a motor, anything that was built or installed, or anything with wheels, basically, they know how to fix. Most of the, you know, the education that these leftists get isn't actually of any use or value to anybody, which is why they they want their student debt canceled. This, by the way, is also why they like to say the more educated someone is, the more likely they are to vote Democrat because they're stupid enough to think that being educated causes people to vote Democrat. And it's like, no, you idiot. Spending four years on a leftist college campus where you're taught by Marxists will make you more likely to vote Democrat. But if you want to talk about who's actually more intelligent, you look at all the people with the highest IQs who are also politically opinionated. They tend to be center right. I could go on about this for an hour, but we're almost through with this movie. So then it cuts to uh, where they're, they're meeting and they're planning about how to, you know, go about this. Basically, what's happening is since all these people spread these rumors about them killing deplorables for sport, which caused them to lose their jobs, they've now decided to just go ahead and actually do it. So they target this, this Gary guy because he's a podcaster who talked about it. They target the first masculine guy uh, from the beginning because he's like a hunter or something. And then another very telling moment about this movie, one of them asks, well, you know, why can't we just kill them all at once? And someone replies, well, if we just kill them, they won't know why. We have an opportunity to teach them. And this is a very extreme example, but it fits the theme of what the left actually believes about the right. They do this whole thing of, we have to teach them. They don't, they don't know any better. They're just, they're just uneducated. Oh no, you don't actually believe that, do you? Oh, you must be joking. You're better than that. Like this very condescending tone as if they know better than you. They know just so much more than you. And that's the other thing. They're trying to play it like, oh, this is a good thing because we can teach them to think correctly. And so then she goes on uh, to this lady's manor. And so they fight to the death, blah, blah, blah. And the lady in charge makes a comment like, oh, this country belongs to the uneducated and ignorant just as much as it does me. And that goes back to what we just talked about. But then the last part where they're both lying there waiting to bleed to death, we find out that the woman in charge kidnapped the wrong woman. So the woman that's lying next to her wasn't actually a deplorable. So she was just fighting back because she had to and wanted revenge, etc. So then that woman says something to the woman in charge about Animal Farm, like, uh, you should be Snowball because you just want to help the world and they make up lies about you. And then the woman in charge dies and the other girl ends up escaping and that's the whole movie. I know it's really dumb, but that last line really summarizes the whole point of this movie. I've read the reviews uh, that claim that, you know, it's about how both sides are bad, both sides are violent, and it's making fun of both sides. No, not really, because the only reason the deplorables have to become violent is because the liberal elites kidnapped them and tried to kill them. And then they try to justify that by saying, well, the deplorables were spreading rumors about us, therefore they actually deserve to be hunted and slaughtered. Like, w with less regard for their lives being displayed than when Orwell the pig died, when the pig got shot to death, one of the women, like, yelled, no, Orwell was innocent! Which is funny because liberals will whine about people eating meat, but then also support, like, unlimited access to abortion because they have no regard for human life because they don't actually love people. They don't actually love their country. They love themselves. That's what liberalism is. Liberalism is literally, like, the worship of the self to refuse to submit to objective order. That's why they think they know better than you. That's why they want your guns. Why they want to take control of your health care. You can't do it. They want to do everything in their power to enact their worldview because they believe that their worldview is the only correct worldview. And uh, it has to be enforced because we're just too stupid to understand. We're too uneducated. 
And that's why the movie ended like that. It was literally, oh, these liberal elites are so benevolent. They only became bad because the conservative rednecks told lies about them. Then, after they just tried to murder the rednecks, the rednecks killed them instead. So we will call them equally bad and pretend that we've made an intelligent political commentary instead of what it actually was, which is frankly an embarrassment from virtually all perspectives. Cinematic, political, artistic, take your pick. But I guess the one good takeaway from this would be that if you try to attack a group of people who love their country and who would die for their country and have like an absurd amount of firepower, it's not gonna, it's not gonna fare too well for you. Hey guys, if you like this video, leave it a thumbs up, leave it a comment down below, and of course, subscribe to the channel. That's it, that's all you have to do. That's it. If you've done it, you're done. Here's your receipt, pull up to the next window. Thank you so much, I hope to see you again. You know, epic spring tour. On the clock, very excited. Go fill out the form. Go fill out the form. You know where to find it. I don't mean to be assertive. I'm just high energy. I can't help it. Sorry for party rocking, but yes, very epic, very excited. It's getting too hot for the suits. It's gonna be, it's, you know what else is on the clock? The cotton button downs for the, for the summer. First day of spring, first day of summer. We'll figure it out. It's getting toasty. But anyways, thank you so much for watching and may God bless America.